Hello and welcome to this discussion about teachers' use of nonverbal behaviour in the classroom. My name is David Bolden and I'm joined today by Professor Julian Elliott from Durham University. Professor Elliott, uh, why, sh why should teachers be concerned about nonverbal behaviour? Well, teachers are highly articulate people who give a lot of consideration to the, to the words that they use, the meaning of the communication. But sometimes what happens is they focus so much upon this that they ignore other crucial messages that they're sending, the non-verbal messages. And these messages are very, very important. For teachers, it is important to be able to do two things. Firstly, they need to be able to understand, to read, to make sense of the non-verbal messages that others send to them, whether that's the children in their class, whether it's parents, whether it's colleagues in the staff room, whoever it is. These people will be sending messages out and the skilled teacher is someone who can read the messages, understand them and know how to respond. But there's another crucial element to non-verbal behaviour and this is about the messages that the teacher sends out himself or herself to the youngsters in their class. And it's crucial that the messages they send are those which are indicative of authority, of confidence and of composure. And wh why is this so important? Nonverbal communication is the primary means by which we communicate to others how we're feeling, our emotions, our understandings. Sometimes what we do as teachers is we try to send one message that we're confident, that we're in charge, that we're sensitive, that we're understanding, that we're patient. But our non-verbal messages send a different message which contrasts with what we're actually saying. Usually what will happen is where these two messages do not fit together is the non-verbal behaviour which will be the most powerful in affecting the understandings and perceptions of those who are observing the teacher. So what are the key elements of non-verbal behaviour? Well, there are a number. Posture, gesture, eye contact, position in the classroom, facial expression, touch and voice. So I'll say a little bit about each of these. Firstly, let's focus upon posture. The posture you adopt says very, very much about how you see yourself in, in, in any interaction with someone else. If you imagine the general in the army passing a subordinate soldier, a private, what you'd often expect to see is that the private would stiffen up, become more rigid, salute in a very sharp way, and you might see the senior officer being far more relaxed, far more uh, less rigid in the way by which they respond. Because in an interaction, the person who has the status, the high status, the senior person in an interaction, is the person who genuinely has the more relaxed posture. Now this works both ways. Because if the teacher goes into the classroom and they're stiff, they're rigid, they're, they're sort of jerky movements, then they're signalling to the children that they don't feel confident, they don't think they're in charge, they don't feel um, that, that their authority is, is clear. Similarly, the children can sometimes um, send messages to the teacher by being overly relaxed, lying across the chair, swinging back, not, not giving the teacher the kind of response you would expect in terms of posture. So the teacher has to be really aware, read the signals in the children, but also be very aware of the, of the signals that they're giving out. The second crucial non-verbal behaviour is gesture. Because the highly skilled teacher uses gesture in a very, very sophisticated way. Sometimes it might be they're talking to a child over here, and someone over there calls out, and rather than turning around and, and berating the child for calling out, they might just put a hand up and just hold their hand up like that. And this is just a message to say, I can hear you, but hang on, I'm dealing with this youngster over here. Sometimes with questioning techniques, the teacher uses their arms to, to gesture, to pull in the answers, to hold, hold uh, interactions up, um, to move people around from A to B. The important thing about gesture is not to over-egg it to the point where it becomes something that you might parody, something that children would find amusing. So it, it, it's, it's a very subtle balance there. Eye contact. It's really important when you look at um, when you look at any pair of people talking to each other to look at the eye contact. If uh, the youngster is um, in a situation where the teacher is berating the child for misbehaviour, say, the child may look down to the floor. They may look down. 
They may have a very sort of stiff, rigid, symmetrical body position, hands behind their backs. And this is sending messages to the teacher concerned that the child is sorry for their wrongdoing, that they're accepting the authority of the teacher. Um, in a sense, what the child's trying to do is to remedy the situation by not challenging the teacher. But then you get other youngsters, and their eye contact's very different. When the teacher's talking to them, maybe looking at them, searching them out, what the child will do is they'll look up at the ceiling perhaps, or they'll look over the shoulder, or they'll sort of turn away in some way, they'll avert their gaze. And this is a very different message, which is, I've got to be here, I have to listen to what you're saying, but I'm not really buying into it, I'm not really taking any notice. Now this kind of behaviour can really, really irritate the teacher and get them very uh, annoyed, angry, sometimes at a level where they're not even consciously aware of. And the third kind of eye contact, of course, is when it's eyeball to eyeball. And this is a very, very difficult situation for some teachers because they feel a huge amount of threat from the other child. And it's at that time you have to handle this extremely well and not react on a physical level and not to demonstrate that this eyeballing is in any way threatening to you. Positioning? Positioning around the room. How close do you get to the child? As you move into space, as you move towards the child, your, your ability to exert influence is increased. But as you get progressively closer to the child, there comes a point when you begin to invade the child's space. And depending upon the age of the child, this can be seen as problematic or less problematic. For a teenager to invade a teenager's space could be inviting uh, a very hostile reaction. With a four-year-old, as you move into their space, you project yourself, you want the child to attend to you and to listen to what you're saying, it's less problematic. But you need to be really aware of your positioning. If the child's sitting at a chair, say a teenager sitting in a chair, and you stand very close to them, uh, overlooking them, sort of towering over them, again, this can sometimes lead to very unfortunate outcomes. So the teacher needs to be really aware of, of their position and their use of space. Facial expression. Another crucial skill. Because what teachers often do is they, cons they focus very heavily upon what they're saying and they're trying to communicate a certain message, but the facial expression kind of betrays them. They have to be careful that the child doesn't look in their face and see fear, anxiety, a lack of confidence, a lack of composure. Because if they do, this will undermine your authority. Touch. But there's two kinds of touch primarily. One kind of touch is affirmation. Um, but the other kind of touch, which is more problematic in these situations, is touch where you try to control someone through the use by gently pushing them in a certain direction or pulling them, whatever. In our society now, that kind of behaviour is not condoned. And it is an unwise teacher who uses touch as a form of control, particularly of the unwilling child. Finally, voice. Voice is an important non-verbal element because here I'm not talking about the words that someone uses, the meaning of the communication, but actually the sound of the voice. But this topic is going to be considered in another video that you and I are involved in. So do all teachers need to constantly monitor their non-verbal behaviour? Uh, certainly they do, but experienced and skilled teachers tend to do this much more automatically. It's the novice teacher, the, the, the teacher who's just at the beginning of their career, who has to put a lot of conscious effort into, into analysing what's going on. The analogy here is someone learning to drive. When you first start to learn to drive, you have to think very closely, carefully, about exactly what you're doing. When you become a skilled driver, of course, you don't have to give that so much consideration because the behaviours have become automatised. But for even for the experienced, highly skilled teacher, when they, are, when they are placed into a situation of challenge, of confrontation, at that point, the, the importance of their non-verbal behaviour will become more salient. It will be more important for them to give conscious thought to exactly what they're saying, what messages they're giving, what they're communicating through their non-verbal actions. Well, thank you for that, Professor Elliot. If you're interested in the issues that have been discussed in this interview today, you can find additional information on the Behaviour for Learning website.